All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, if you haven't heard me before, my name is Michael Devlin. I have a mega icon team, which means a really big team with EXP Realty. And today we're talking about disclosures. And in fact, this is one of a series that I'm going to do to go through the different disclosures. And I, I my goal is to do it from the point of view of a real estate agent, right? Rather than an intellectual discussion of disclosures, um, how to get the forms filled out, what's the best practices, what do you need to worry about, what should you do, all that sort of stuff. Um, if we, there's five disclosures that are, well, let's just say different than the other disclosures. And if we, if I were going to give you an, a, a quiz question on this, I would list them and ask, what do these disclosures have in common, right? And the five are the transfer disclosure statement, the seller property questionnaire, the fire hardening disclosure, and defensible space. The earthquake disclosure, the form, and the solar um, questionnaire and advisory, those five in particular have something in common. Do you want to hear the list again? The TDS. This class is already kind of tedious, isn't it? Well, any, never mind. The TDS, the SPQ, the fire hardening and defensible space, the earthquake, and the solar disclosure, which of course you only need if you have like, you know, solar panels. What do they all have in common, right? I don't see anybody blurting out the answer, um, but I'll tell you, how about that? What they all have in common is that these are forms that have to be completed by the seller. And the way the software is written, you can't answer the TDS questions unless you put your email down as the seller's email and have it sent to yourself. And if you get caught doing this, you not only would probably be kicked out by your broker, the Department of Real Estate would be, well, let's just say heaved that you did this, right? These are forms that the seller has to fill out. Now, the earthquake form, which we have a copy of, I know you guys, because you attend these classes, you're up on all this stuff. So this may just you know, be something you already knew, but I'm sure you all know that that particular disclosure form on earthquakes has to be completed if the property was built, if it's a single family wood frame residence built before January 1st, 1960, you guys already knew that, or if it's a masonry building, if it was built before January 1st, 1975, right? You knew that, didn't you? Didn't, didn't, didn't you know that? Now, the, the booklet, the earthquake booklet, you have to give to everyone. But the form that asks questions about things that you may not know, like, you know, do you have cripple walls, right? That, that form is only required if a property is built before January 1st, 1960. Now, many brokers and many agents just fill it out every time they have a listing. Why? Because, in fact, I was at a, I was elsewhere at another real estate company, and somebody asked me in front of the broker and the manager, you know, about that law, and I rattled off the January first, nineteen sixty, and they were going, no, 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 don't tell them that. Tell them you need it every time, right? Just tell them that, right? Because that way, there's no harm if you do it in advance. I'll tell you this, however, I wasn't planning to spend this much time on earthquake, but why not? Um, I'll tell you this, if I have a property and I'm the listing agent and it was built after January 1st, 1960, and during escrow, your transaction coordinator says, we want a copy of this form, I'm not going to give it to you, right? I won't give it to you. Because if we, if I were to give it to you, it would constitute a new disclosure triggering a right of rescission and the contract doesn't require it and the law doesn't require it if the property was built after 1960. Now there's no problem with doing it in advance with the seller because there's, a, but, but don't do it. Uh, we'll talk about that. Rescission rights if you change the form. Now I've pasted in a, a link to a folder which should be accessible by anyone. 
everyone, some of you. And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the things that are in this, some of the things that are in the folder I plan on getting to later. You can save this folder, those of you that understand shared drives as a shared link. And when I add to it next week or whenever I do it again, you know, you can, uh, it'll be there, right? Or you can just come back and I'll paste it again. So this is the sales disclosure checklist provided by the California Association of Realtors legal department. They break it into three groups. Group number one is the always group. That's the one in green. Group number two is the sometimes group. And group number three is, well, I don't know, a bonus disclosure, right? A bonus disclosure. So the idea of this disclosure chart, and, and by the way, if your broker might have their own list, right? This is what the California Association of Realtors says is statutorily or contractually required. This is the always list, right? And if you check the box, always you have to do this, right? Um, but EXP, as well as other brokers I've worked with, have their own checklist because they have their own disclosures to throw in. You should get your hands on that or, well, have a good transaction coordinator, right? Yeah, I don't know, that already has the list. So the TDS and SPQ, basically what this is set up for is that you could check it off as you go through. And what we're going to be talking about today is the first ones on this list, the TDS, SPQ, and the AVID. And it gives you a, you know, sort of an explanation, the transfer disclosure statement and the seller property questionnaire is usually required on one to four units residential property. That would include condos, townhomes, single family homes. Also, it would include manufactured homes, mobile homes, right? They're all included in the transfer disclosure statement requirement. And there are links that the, the California Association of Realtors legal department has put in if you want to read some of their background information. We're going to go through the practical, the form itself and some thoughts about, you know, um, thoughts about um, filling it out. The AVID, the Agent Visual Inspection Disclosure, this is a little bit misleading in that the law does not require that an agent fill out an AVID form. It doesn't require that. What it requires is that the agent conduct a reasonably prudent, competent, I think the word is diligent, a reasonable, diligent inspection of the property and that the agent disclose material facts that the agent sees or knows about, right? They don't, you don't have to, you know, crawl in the chimney and look around, but areas that are readily accessible. So technically the form is not required by the law. Most brokers, well, many brokers, I haven't surveyed them, require the form, right? EXP wants to form. Right? Most of the major brokerages want the form. But technically, you could write your AVID, your agent visual inspection disclosure on a yellow sticky note and attach it and send it to the buyer. Now, the downside of doing something like that or just scrawling in something that says nothing noted or nothing to disclose the downside of doing something like that is that if this ever ends up in court, um, if it ever ends up in court, one of the questions is going to be, one of the questions is going to be, were you competent? Were you diligent? And if you have a sticky note for your visual inspection, they might conclude that you're not really doing a professional competent job, right? They might, they might jump to that conclusion. Now, this checklist goes through some of the others. We're going to talk about some of these in other, other sessions. The NHD, by the way, the AVID and the TDS are not required on five or more units. 
not required on commercial property. The natural hazard disclosure is required everywhere. Agency disclosure is required pretty much everywhere, right? I'm not gonna go through all of these right now, but we're gonna talk about them. Um, the yellow is the, well, sometimes. And the sometimes forms would include things like an exempt seller disclosure. So if you're not required to fill out the TDS, the transfer disclosure statement, then there's the ESD, the exempt seller disclosure. Again, the law does not specifically refer to that form, it doesn't specifically refer to the form. However, most brokers want to see that form because there's questions in it that the seller is required to disclose, even if they're exempt from the TDS. The WHS is the uh, Wilmington High School, no, that's not right, the Water Heater and Smoke Detector Statement of Compliance. Now, the reason that that's added here is because the TDS already contains a section about water heater and smoke detector statement of compliance. I see a lot of, I could see more, I'd like to see more, more escrows and more disclosure packages and some agents throw everything in. So they have a TDS and a WHS. And the wording, by the way, on the water heater smoke detector disclosure is exactly the same as the wording in the TDS, but I don't know, right? If you want to do this, I guess, why not, right? It's like wearing suspenders and a belt. Right? Well, maybe not. Um, the FHDS, if the property was built before 2010, it is in a high or very high fire zone, then that's going to kick in. You, you see what I mean? Now, the consumer, right? California Consumer Privacy Act is just hardwired into the forms because, you know, it just is, right? Because it's something that you're supposed to, uh, it went into effect last year, anyhow, or a couple of years ago. Well, the Homeowner's Guide to Earthquake Safety, again, notice it says built before 1960, we give them all the booklets and things like that. Exemptions are the same as it, anyhow. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but if you've never seen this form, you might, you know, look at it, if you've got a transaction coordinator and you're working for a broker that has their own checklist, then this is already going to be taken care of. Um, we're going to go through the ones that I, I find create the most you know, consternation. And then other available ones, the Fair Housing Advisory is hardwired into the form, the Statewide Buyer and Seller Advisory, Market Conditions Advisory, non-contingent offer advisory, wire fraud advisory, probate advisory, short sale advisory, these are all bonuses. Now, the buyer inspection advisory is hardwired into the purchase agreement. Um, buyer material issues is almost never used by real estate agents, just about never used. Um, there's, these are all the booklets which are a change in the law, by the way, for those of you that are interested in this sort of thing, the change in the law was that previously the law said you had to give the booklets to the buyer. Now the law says that giving them a link to the booklets is good enough. So most of the NHD companies, everyone I know of, contains the links to the booklets. So if you get a signature, if you represent the seller, if you get a signature from the buyer that they got the NHD and all of that, it's going to satisfy the requirement. Uh, homeowner Association Advisory, Trust Advisory, REO, look at there's yeah, there. And um, every year they add a few more. Let's look at, let's look at the big one, all right? the big one. We're going to start with the transfer disclosure statement. Right? Now, this law was passed in uh, 1985, and it was in response to a court case called Easton versus Strasburger, uh, involved Concord, California, where Mrs. Easton had bought a house. 
and from a seller by the name of Strasburger. And it turns out that the house was built on fill. That's not the name of some guy that was buried there, but fill dirt. And, and there were hairline cracks in the sidewalk, the driveway, the foundation. Uh, the agent didn't know that it was built on fill. The seller knew, but uh, didn't tell anybody because it would diminish their enthusiasm to buy his house. So he didn't bother to tell anybody. And afterwards, the agent, would, when the, the, the whole house needed to be torn down, red tagged, all that sort of stuff. So they sued, they sued the seller and they sued the real estate agent. And what really got the attention of the real estate community is they found the real estate agent was partially liable. Most of the liability went to the seller, but it said, the court said that the agent and the seller were jointly and severally liable, which means you could collect from both of them or either one. In Strasburger, the seller had already, you know, was broke. Real estate agents have Arizona emissions insurance. And so the agent's e o paid off Mrs. Easton. That's how she's referred to, by the way in the court case, that's how I'm just saying, that's how it's, and um, that freaked out the real estate community because we knew that we were responsible to disclose material facts that we knew of. But the twist in this one is they ruled that this was something the agent should have known, should have known. All right. Not that the agent knew it and didn't say, but the agent should have known it. And if the agent had conducted a reasonably competent, prudent visual inspection of the property. Now, some of you might already be getting the idea of why I recommend to all sellers that you get a termite inspection, a property inspection. If the house has a roof, a roof inspection. If we have a pool, a pool inspection. Right? You ought to get all of the inspections and you ought to get them up front before you put the property on the market. Can you kind of see why that might be a good idea? Is there a way to see the court case or documents as an example? Easton versus Strasburger is the name of the court case. If you go to Google and type it in, you'll find you can get a copy of the court case. So in response to that court case, the California Association of Realtors lobbied the state of California to pass the transfer disclosure law. And what it says is that the seller has to answer certain questions. And if the seller lies, the seller is responsible. The listing agent has to conduct a reasonably diligent visual inspection. And if there's a buyer's agent, they have to do it too. That's what it says. Right, and that you're only responsible for your part. You're not supposed to fill out the other people's parts. All right, so filling this out, the first part is pretty simple. In the city of, you put in the city, county of, you put in the county, described, and you put in the address. Is somebody asking a question? Yeah, Kim Dates. What? How are you, I, I have the question about how an agent would know that it's built on fill. Well, because what they're, you're not required to do a soil sample, but if there are cracks in the sidewalk, cracks in the foundation, if doors and windows stick when you're opening them, that's usually evidence of settling. And a property inspector would note all those things and would say in the inspection, hey, you ought to have somebody look at the soil. You ought to have a foundation inspection because some of the things seem to be caused by a settling unevenness. I sold a house in an area of San Jose called Vista Park, which is known for soil problems. The house kind of looked like, and this is a, a regional story, so I don't know, you may not get it, but in Santa Cruz, there's a place called the Mystery House, right? Where everything is like this. You could put, uh, I put a tennis ball in the, on the floor in the kitchen, let go, and it rolled and bounced off the wall. So that was kind of obvious, right? But usually you're looking for cracks in the driveway, cracks in the sidewalk, cracks in the foundation, doors and windows that stick. That's usually a sign of settling. But if you get a property inspection, they're going to probably point that out. 
right? That's why it's good. And I know the seller's going to say, well, when I bought the house, I had to pay for all the inspections. Now I'm selling it and you're telling me I had to pay for the inspections. That doesn't seem fair. We're trying to avoid being sued. You know what I mean? And we're just trying to avoid that. And that would be getting the inspection would be, you know, a good idea. Did that answer your question? All right. Date is the date you prepare it, which sort of time stamps it. Coordination with other disclosures. It's made pursuant to 1102 civil code of a statute required disclosures, depending upon the nature of the fund, special studies on purchase money liens, substituted, substituted disclosures. The following disclosures and other disclosures required by law, including the natural hazard report slash statement that may include airplane and other big fire flight officials have or will be made in connection with this real estate transfer and are intended to satisfy the disclosure requirement obligations on this form where the subject matter is the same. And then you can type in things. You could check the box. It says inspection reports pursuant to the contract or receipt. You could type, you could select the box, additional inspection reports or disclosures, or you could check the box, no substituted disclosures. All right, now uh, this brings us to a quiz. Can everybody see a poll on the screen? Yes. Okay. Quiz question. That paragraph that I just read, which of the following would you include? Would you include an NHD, a termite, a property, all of the above? Most of you are not answering the poll, but all of the above is leading. Come on. How do you feel? You're you got a listing. You're filling out the form. Give you a few more seconds. It will take about one minute. All right. Here we go. And um, pretty close. Not everybody's answered it. So I'm going to I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. So I assume you all can see the results that are being shared. Most of you picked all of the above, correct? The answer is, well, the answer is none of the above. What? The answer is none of the above. None of the above. All right, not all of the above. Now, some of you may be thinking, you're wrong. My broker says, this is where we write in that we have a term member part of property inspection. We write in the NH, we write in all those. You might have, you might have a mentor who told you that you're supposed to write in all that stuff. You might have watched YouTube video where they tell you to write in all that stuff. But what I'm going to refer to, what I'm going to refer to is the California Association of Realtors legal department guide on substituted disclosures. And they explain that when the law went into effect, there was this idea that at some point the law might be modified to allow a property inspection, a termite inspection, an NHD and other inspections to substitute for the transfer disclosure statement. That was an idea. So when they designed the form, they made it so you can, oh, the poll isn't, where is the, you're saying the poll is still there? And you go, I didn't know, where's the poll? Stop recording, polls, polls, polls. All right, sorry about that. So this is um, connected to the material I gave you. Thank you, Valerie, for, uh, so what this is the, the California Association of Realtors legal department guide as to what substituted disclosures mean. And you heard my explanation. When they designed the form, they designed the form with the anticipation that at some point 
they might change the transfer disclosure law to allow a property inspection, termite inspection, a roof inspection, all those inspections to substitute for the transfer. Is it still on the screen? Some of you have to click it because I've, I've shut the poll down. All right. All right. Not on my screen. John, thank you. So when and why was this included? And they give a history. What is a substituted disclosure intended to satisfy the disclosure obligations of the TDS? Intended to satisfy the disclosure obligation. So should prior inspection reports and disclosures be specified in the TDS? The answer is no. No. Those reports should not should be used to supplement but not substitute for the seller's TDS. The better place to refer and attach those documents would be in an explanation under Section 2, B, or C of the TDS or in response to a question on the SPQ, which we're going to get to. But no, should the, should the seller check no substituted disclosures? In most cases, yes. Most cases, yes. So despite what you may have been told, the answer is no, there are no substituted disclosures. Now, is it the end of the world that you write in all this stuff there? Yes, but if you're doing it, you're thinking, and this is essentially what the form is saying, that those reports and inspections substitute for the seller completing the transfer disclosure statement. They do not. So we're going to give them to the buyer. We're going to get the buyer to sign off on them, but they do not substitute for the transfer disclosure statement. I've had agents tell me, you're wrong, right? You're wrong, right? My bro I've been a broker for 14 years. I'm in the top 1% of Goldwell Banker agents. You're wrong. And then I show them what the California Association of Realtors legal department says. And I had one say, they're wrong. They're wrong. Right, the lawyers who wrote the, they're wrong, right? So, and by the way, I, I was a broker longer than that. I'm still a broker and I'm a certified by the California Association of Realtors legal department to teach their forms. I'm just saying here is what you should be checking, no substituted disclosures. Seller information, okay. Now, um, this is basically checklists. This is sometimes a little bit difficult for sellers. If we were looking at this in zip forms or in Skyslope, depending on which system you use to get documents signed, um, and the, um, these are all grayed out because they have to be answered by the seller. Um, I, I don't know, somebody, I, I'm looking at the form. Most people can see it, Roxanne, I don't know. Kim asked, should we attach all those disclosures or inspections in the MLS for agents to show their buyers ahead of times? Yes. Yeah, let me. If you give the transfer disclosure statement and all of those disclosures to a buyer prior to writing an offer, the contents of those disclosures no longer trigger a right of rescission. If you give a buyer the TDS within after they're in contract, they have three days to back out. Their three days to back out does not have to be a reasonable three days. In other words, the seller prop, I hope this isn't getting too, the seller property questionnaire is different from the transfer disclosure statement. The transfer disclosure statement is required by Civil Code Section 1102, hardwired into the law. The seller property questionnaire is part of the residential purchase agreement. In my area, there's another type of purchase agreement that is used sometimes called the PRDS, which stands for the Peninsula Regional Data Service. It's a purchase agreement, and they have their own questionnaire, right? They have their own seller checklist. So the law does not require the SPQ 
And the residential purchase agreement says that if you're backing out based upon a contingency or something, it has to be done reasonably. So for example, I, we had a transaction where the seller had failed to answer all the questions in the SPQ. And the buyer wanted out of the transaction. So the buyer said, it says in the RPA, the residential purchase agreement, that the seller has completed the seller property questionnaire and the TDS when they've answered all of the questions. They've answered all of the questions. So we got a notice to perform demanding that the seller answer the other two questions, the ones that they did not answer. By the way, if you're the agent of the seller, you ought to be remembering this you want to make sure they answered every question. Now, the answers to the two questions the seller didn't answer were no. The buyer said, we're going to back out because we have a three-day right of rescission. And I said, no, that's not going to work because we said no, there was nothing to disclose. So banking out on that is not uh, reasonable. It's not in good faith. That's what it says in the contract. But the TDS is different. If the seller doesn't answer a question in the TDS and then has to amend the TDS, the buyer gets three days to back out. The buyer does not have to use good faith. It doesn't matter that the seller said, no, we don't have that, or no, it's not a problem. The civil code says that if it's amended, it triggers another three-day right of rescission. My, my recommendation, if you represent a seller, is that before you put the property on the market, you get everything. You get the TDS, the SPQ, the market conditions advisory, all of the documents, all of the disclosures. You get a termite report, a property inspection, an NHD, you get everything. And you put it in a way, in a place where the buyer can get access to it before they write the offer. And you insist that they sign a receipt or sign off on all of those disclosures and that they send it to you with the offer. In Silicon Valley, where I'm located, this is done at least 80% of the time. As you leave Silicon Valley, that percentage drops. Now, the reason you want to do this is that if you would like the buyer to make an offer that isn't contingent on inspection, you're going to have to provide the inspections. So one of my team members who is else not in Silicon Valley was telling me, well, you don't understand, right? Down in Southern California, we don't do that. We don't do all the inspections that we're listing we don't do any of that. We make the buyer pay for their own inspections. You don't, that's just the way we do it. Well, the buyer makes an offer. There's no loan contingency. There's no appraisal contingency. But because there were no inspections, none of this stuff was done in advance, there was an inspection contingency. The house appraised for 70,000 under what the purchase price was. There's no appraisal contingency. But now the buyer is saying, you know, we've been looking at the HOA documents. Yeah. And the HOA documents say we can only have two pets. And we really wanted to get a third pet. So we're backing out. Give us our deposit back. And the listing agent says, oh, my God, no, my God, don't do that. What can we do? What can we do to keep this going? And they said, lower the price by 50 grand. Now, it was pretty obvious that what they were doing is using the inspection contingency as an appraisal contingency. But there's no way to, they have an out, right? The inspection contingency is, this is what the inspection contingency says in the RPA. The buyer's acceptance of the condition of the property and any other matter affecting the property is a contingency of this agreement. That's word for word what it says. You understand that's a get out of escrow free card for the buyer. If you provide all of this up front, you've removed that get out of escrow free card 
because you could get them to remove their inspection contingency. So yes, my recommendation is you get everything done in advance, get it all together, put it in a disclosure link so that they can and download it, the buyer and the buyer's agent, and require that they sign a receipt with their offer saying that they've already gotten read all these different documents. All right. All right. So this is about answering questions on the sample form. You don't see that they're all blacked out. If you were in zip forms, this can't be answered by the agent. The agent can't go through and check the boxes and then send it to them for signatures. Um, it asks, are there any of the best to the seller's knowledge that are not in operating condition? If yes, what are they? Attach additional sheets. Are you aware of any significant defects or malfunctions in the property? If yes, check the boxes, ceiling, floors, exteriors. This is if the seller is aware. Other structural components. What oftentimes happens is the seller will say, well, you know, we hear creaking sometimes, you know, at night. Do, do we have to disclose it? Yes. <laughs> if we do, our, do we use our own network team appraisal, home inspector, and termite inspectors? Or do we get our own? Do we pay before listing the home or when the house closes escrow for their services? So um, there are inspectors that I like to work with. However, you're not required to use them. Um, the company that I like is called CalPro, but they're in Silicon Valley, and they um, do all the inspections, but you ought to find local inspectors if you're not around. The appraisal is a higher, th that's done by the loan, the lender, and it doesn't, you know, they're going to, it doesn't matter that you have an appraisal, they're going to get their own appraisal. And um, yes, some of them will bill escrow and some of them will not. And they oftentimes charge more if they bill escrow. But many of the inspectors will bill escrows, especially in larger metropolitan areas where there's more competition. But if you're in a remote area where there aren't very many inspectors, many times none of them will bill escrow. They want to be paid up front. And they can get away with it. But in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of inspectors. And some of them say, hey, we'll build Ezra. You know, hire us. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, you're welcome. Installation. So here are check boxes. Now, by the way, recently I involved one of my one of my peeps is in a transaction. Uh, we removed contingencies, hmm. yeah, yeah. removed contingencies, and then the lender started to say, oh, this isn't going to work. The HOA put in this document, there's deferred maintenance. We looked at the pictures in the appraisal, it looks bad. Uh, we want to see the termite inspection, ooh, it looks bad. We're not going to make the loan. So the listing agent was saying, well, you've removed your loan contingency. You don't have any contingencies. We're going to keep your deposit. Yeah, we're going to keep your deposit. You'll never get your money back. Ha ha, right? Get a lawyer. We'll fight you for it. So I look at the SPQ and the TDS, and I've noticed that not only didn't they answer a couple of questions in the TDS, they had incorrect answers to some of the questions. For example, this was a single family home and on number two, features of the property shared in common with adjoining landowners, the seller had picked no. Really? No fences? You don't have a fence around the property? Well, they did, the answer was really yes. Um, was there other modification done without permits? We know the answer was yes, but they had picked no. Notice they're asking about fill dirt, any settling, flooding. There also was a question here about CCNRs. That's number 12, which is in homeowner associations. The seller had picked no. The seller basically picked no all down that list. 
several of which were obviously incorrect. So we sent a notice to perform, two day notice to perform, answer the questions properly. You gave wrong answers, amend your transfer disclosure statement. What that does, first of all, the listing agent refused to communicate any more about this. <laughs> and after two days, it gave the buyers the right to cancel the contract. It, it also, however, we're closing on it. We got a you know, different lender, but we're closing on that transaction. The listing agent stopped threatening to keep the deposit, right? Stopped threatening. So if you're the listing agent, you're going to want to take a peek at this. Because if they answer wrong, obviously wrong, you might want to talk to them about it and get it revised before you give it to the buyer. Because if it's wrong and you give it to the buyer and the buyer wants out, the buyer can make you amend it and then there's a three-day right of rescission. Automatic, can't be way. By the way, the buyer's right to cancel within three days of receipt. This is if after they make the offer, they get the TDS or an amended TDS. It says in the California Civil Code, this cannot be waived by the buyer. So one of my questions is, is, well, if the buyer removed all their contingencies, does that remove this one? And the answer is no, it's in the law. How should the filler sell out the part asking about awareness of defects? If there is a termite or wood rot, but it's in the process of being addressed by a contractor, I would well. First of all, if you've got termite reports, property inspections, or any of that sort of stuff, the SPQ requires that you give you attach them, that you give them copies. By the way, it wants not just a current one but past one. So you would you would disclose that. I would be saying, yes, there is a defect. There's termites. We're in the process of having it addressed. But you would just say it. All right. But you have to admit to it that you know. It. Anyhow, you see the idea. Can you use a home inspection done six months ago? The home inspections don't have like a you know expiration date, like a milk bottle or something like that, milk carton. Um, however, it's all up to the buyer. The property inspection is not a required by law inspection, right? In fact, I've sold properties that I, I've sold a house and that the buyer never even walked inside of because it was a teardown, right? So there was no home inspection, no termite inspection. Why do we want to know how many termites we're going to kill when we bulldoze the house down? So it's not a requirement, but if it's too old, it would bring up the question, has anything broken since then? Um, generally speaking, a six month old property inspection um, would be considered maybe too old, right? I would get a new one. Any lawsuits by or against the seller threatening to or affecting the property? Uh, any of that, threatening, claims of breach of warranty, um, common areas, if yes, answer questions. Paragraph D, this is the smoke detector water heater statement of compliance. It says the seller certifies that the property has a close of escrow being compliance with 131 anyhow, health and safety code by having operable smoke detectors, which are approved, listed, and installed in accordance with state fire market regulations. The seller certifies that the property will be in compliance of the water heater bracing, anchoring, and strap. And um, yeah. Now, even if this is an exempt transaction, like for example, it's, uh, and we're gonna talk about what is an exempt transaction in a bit, but something that is exempt is when the, it's a what's called a vested trust, somebody's dying. And it's a probate, I'll use probate. Trust is a little trickier. I'll explain that in a minute. But let's say it's a probate sale. So if it's a probate sale, that's exempt from the transfer disclosure law. It's one of the exemptions. Bankruptcy sales, probate sales, that sort of thing. However, if you represent the buyer, you should know that this will probably not get passed an appraiser. 
unless you have the smoke detector and the water heater scratch. Right? Won't, won't make it, right? Because the appraiser is going to say, uh-uh, you know, this has to be done before we're going to close escrow. So in that case, somebody has to do it. Right? I'm just saying, right? Sometimes it's the agent. Paragraph three is, um, and paragraph three is the agent, the listing agent section. The box EXP wants to see checked is see attached agent visual inspection disclosure. Most of the brokers I worked with want to see that. Agent notes no items for disclosure. Really? All right. Now you can do that. All right, let me, let me go this way. Let's say the seller has a property inspection, a termite inspection, a roof inspection, a pool inspection. And the agent thinks, well, this is pretty good. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to say, I don't, I, I don't know of anything else wrong. So I'm just going to say no items for disclosure. The question really is, does the, is it possible that the agent might see, hear, or know about something that would be a material fact about the property that is not contained in a property inspection, for example? There is a a seller who across the street and down a few houses, a convicted sex offender had previously convicted, moved in. Um, and yes, videotaping from your phone is good. In the AVID, you can attach pictures, very good. Um, so a sex offender, a few doors down moved in. Now the seller, didn't want to say to the buyers that there's a sex offender that lives in the neighborhood. And if you read this, it doesn't actually have a question about are there any sex offenders you know, in the neighborhood? However, it really does ask, is there anything that malfunctions about the property? Well, the listing agent was farming that area. And the listing agent knew because she had sold other homes that the sex offender lived in the neighborhood. So the question is, does the listing agent have to disclose that to a buyer? And the answer is yes, because the listing agent knew. So what the seller did is he listed it the next time with an agent that was not from that specific area who did not know that there was a sex offender located in the neighborhood. By the way, this eventually didn't turn out well for the seller, but do you understand if you're the listing agent and you actually know stuff like there's noise in the neighborhood, right? That if you know stuff, you're supposed to disclose that. So where I'm going with this is that the agent's inspection, see right now we're only talking about the agent's visual inspection. But the law says that you as an agent should disclose all material facts that are in your knowledge. I disclosed the sex offender in the neighborhood with the seller's approval. Buyer was a female cop who left and said, yeah, oh, that's, that's true. But, but you see, it's, you, you just have to say so, right? You just need to disclose. If you don't disclose and then the buyer buys it and then the buyer finds out because the neighbors are going to run over and say, wow, you're pretty brave. You bought the house right next to the sex offender. Um, now we're talking lawyer. Right? So we're going to talk about the AVID in a moment. Um, in agent inspection, this would be the buyer's agent. So there's possibility of two agents. An interesting fact is that if the listing agent does not complete this section, does not give an AVID or check one of these boxes, sign it and do all that, then the transfer disclosure dis statement is not complete and when and, and the buyer can back out of the con out of the contract and get their money back if the listing agent doesn't do their AVID. 
right? I'm just going to assume when you hear the word AVID, you're going to realize it means the form, but it means your visual inspection disclosure, whether you use the form or not. If the listing agent doesn't do it, then the buyer can back out. If the listing agent does it after the escrow, after the contract's been accepted, the buyer can back out. But what about the buyer's agent? You might be thinking, well, wait a second. If the buyer's agent just doesn't fill out the form and then later fills out the form, doesn't that give my buyer three days to back out? And the answer is no, no, they thought of this. And so if the buyer's agent doesn't do it, this, by the way, is not only in the California Civil Code, but also in the purchase agreement. It's a, a bad for the buyer's agent, but it does not give the buyer the right to back out. I also disclosed on another property, there had been a murder in the home. Neighbors couldn't wait to tell the buyer who said, I know. Yes, disclosure of death. I'm sure you all know, you know, that rule. Um, it comes from a court case called Reed versus King, which was uh, some time ago. I don't want to mention the name of the broker involved, but it was Coldwell Banker. And it, it's not, I mean, Coldwell Banker was, is a big company and they, they have one broker for a large area. So they, you know, more of this gets picked up. But um, what happened in Reed versus King is the listing agent, when they found out that a murder had been committed in the house, um, not only said to the seller, well, we don't want to tell people about this, you know, give them the willies or something, and then went and told the neighbors, hey, we're trying to sell the house. If you see somebody looking at it, you know, keep the thing about the murder, you know, on the down low. And so they sold it, uh, a single mother moves in, the neighbors run over and say, oh, you bought the murderer's house, you know, and she sued and won. And it had been seven years before that the murder had occurred. So the current law, as I'm sure all of you know, says that if somebody died in the last three years, you have to disclose it. You have an affirmative duty to disclose it. That means that you have to tell the buyer whether they ask or not. Now, the law also says that if the buyer asks you, has anyone died in the house? Let's say it was, I've known people that waited three years to put their home on the market. <laughs> so they didn't have to disclose it. But if the buyer asks, you can't lie. Right. So if it was four or five or six years ago, you have to tell them the truth. I've had buyers who go through obituaries to look and see if anyone died in the house, right? Or if anyone died that owned the house. And then they want to know did they die in the house? Did they not? You know, it's um, and I've included in the in the folder some information about that. But three years have to disclose it. And in fact, I believe, uh, anyhow, it's someplace, it's coming up. What else do we have? Here's an overview of the law, um, one to four. And if renovation is being done on the property, won't it be better for the listing agent to fill out her AVID after renovation is completed, in which case, won't it be better to have this? Yes, the, T the TDS and the AVID and all of that can be done after you've done renovation, right? But you should do it before you put the house on the market. And there's usually a time period between, you know, you, you do the repairs, you clean, you paint, you stage, you do get the disclosures together. But I wouldn't have, I would wait till all the work was being done so that, because they might have fixed something that you don't need to talk about anymore because it was sick. Should you do inspections after the work is done? Um, you can. First of all, I would do the inspections after the work is done. If that's what you're, I mean, that is exactly what your question says. Um, you can, if it's termite and you have the termite inspection done first and then you do work, then you can get it re-inspection, re-inspected and get a clearance. But yes, I would do the work first then do inspections. 
How many seller, how many seller? Anyhow, so this is just a little in, information. What are the consequences of not providing a transfer disclosure statement? The buyer can back out. That's California courts have held that if the seller does not provide a TDS, the buyer before close of escrow may cancel the purchase agreement. And that give, means get their money back. I thought you needed to disclose repairs fixed during renovation. The answer is yes. These are two different issues, right? So one issue is when we get to the seller property questionnaire, one of the questions they ask is, have you done renovations? Have you painted? Have you done any of these things? And that's to disclose that work has been done, been done on the property, right? Now that's different. So you do the work, you tell the buyer we did the work, you then have it re-inspected or a property inspection done after the work has been done where they test all the, you know, the lights and they flush the toilets and run the water and they do all that sort of stuff and you, you've got it. But yes, we're, the SPQ requires that you discuss the uh, repairs that have been done. Um, I, I guess we're only going to do the TDS today. I'll do the AVID next week. Does that, does that sound like fun? I might show you some samples that I have. Huh? Um, exemptions, who's exempt? New home subdivisions. That's because in a new home subdivision, you get something called a public report. So if they're buying a new home subdivision, they don't get a transfer disclosure statement, they get a public report. Essentially what the law says is that if this, the public report comes from the Department of Real Estate, that if you get a public report, then you don't have to do the TDS. However, where there is no public report is required. Um, anyhow, if, if, if there is a public report or no public report, if it's a brand new home, you don't have to do it. Court ordered probate sales, bankruptcies, foreclosure sales, and a decedent's estate, guardianship, conservatorship, or trust. Not all trusts are equal. The trust they're referring to here is somebody has died and it's being probated or it's in a trust settlement, which is still a type of probate sometimes. Notice it says an, exempt, an exception to the exemption is that if it's a revocable trust, which is typically called a family trust. And what the rule says is, is that if the person that's the trustee has lived there in the past year or has ever owned the property in their own name, then they still have to do the transfer disclosure statement. Would you answer the question regarding lawyers? Would the seller answer no lawsuit if there had been one, but it was already settled? Um, if there had been a lawsuit and it had been settled, I would mention that on the SPQ. There isn't a time period on those kinds of disclosures. The seller property questionnaire asks about lawsuits, right? It, it doesn't have, and even the TDS also asks about lawsuits. And it doesn't have any lawsuits by or against the seller. It doesn't say in the last year, last five years, or anything like that. Is probate estate exempt from the SPQ? Yeah, we generally exempt the seller property questionnaire. And um, this is in the residential purchase agreement, is only included when a TDS is included, right? If, the, if a TDS is included, it has to be included. It's not a requirement of the law, it's a requirement of the residential purchase agreement, but not if, it, if you use the probate addendum and advisory, it says you don't get a TDS or an SPQ. It's an exempt disclosure. What's the difference between if title is held in an irrevocable and not a revocable trust? A revocable trust is a family trust. So if I have a revocable trust, I could add things to the trust. I could take things out of the trust. 
right? It's sometimes called an inter vivos trust, which means while alive, a living trust. But then if somebody dies, then the trust becomes locked, right? It's the word is vested and it gets locked into the estate. Now, the logic behind this is that if a husband and a wife just create a trust because there's tax benefits, there's estate planning benefits, you can avoid going through the probate hassle potentially, um, but they're both alive, that's a revocable trust. If they got divorced, the trust would be broken, it would be revoked. Right now, if one of them dies, however, now the trust is locked and it's not a revocable trust. It's too late to change your mind. I mean, it's too late. I hope I don't know if that helps. Uh, exemptions. Who is exempt? Is that the same one I just went over? Maybe not. Um, is, is it the same that I don't know? That's an overview. Here's exemptions. Maybe I went back. Substituted disclosures. I already did that. Couldn't the living spouse revise the trust? No, not necessarily. If it's um, a vested trust, right? It all depends upon the way the trust is drawn. Usually the trust is drawn in such a way that it's a estate planning vehicle. So instead of having a will, right? Or, I mean, you could still have a will, but the, instead of having, it can take a long time to get through probate, right? It's a minimum of four months before they can do anything. Probates could take 18 months easy, easy. So rather than writing a will and I write a will, leaving it to her and she writes a will, leaving it to me, and then, you know, whoever outlasts the other one gets it after the probate period, we create a trust. But when one of the trustors dies, then the trustees, usually both of them are trustees, is when the trust vests in the beneficiary that is still alive. If you want, I could get somebody to, this is a longer discussion than what I had planned for today to explain the nature of the different trusts. Most, if somebody hasn't died, then it's a living trust and it's subject most of the time to the transfer disclosure law. Supposing the property, I should have made this a quiz question, a poll. Supposing the property is owned by an LLC. Do you have to do a TDS? The property is owned by an LLC. Do you have to do a TDS? Supposing the property is owned by an investor who's never lived in the property, never lived in the property. And the property is in the name of the investor's LLC. Do you have to do a TDS? Anybody want to vote on that one? The answer is yes, yes, very good. The answer is yes. I've had investors say, I ain't going to do it. I never lived there. You're just trying to get me to answer questions so I can get in trouble later. I ain't going to fill it out. And you know, I pointed out to them that I checked again in the civil code and they weren't mentioned as being an exception. You know, I looked to see if their name was on the list. It's not on the list. If you look at the exemptions, what you're going to not see is it's an investor who didn't live there who has an LLC. That is not on the list of exemptions. They still have to do it to the best of their ability. You know, still have to do it. Now, sometimes if they refuse, I don't, at EXP, we want you to ask three times in, in writing and get them to refuse. Hopefully they reply. And if the seller won't fill it out, you tell them the buyer can back out if they want to before close of escrow. I don't care, I'm gonna do it. You still do your AVID. You still do your AVID and give it to the buyer, right? right. You know, but does, we can't make them do it. Right? I've had, and by the way, I had one guy who said, I ain't gonna do it. And so I, I took the TDS and I put it in that the, 
seller refuses to fill it out, and I got him to initial it. <laughs> Anyhow, um, was that good for you guys for the TDS? I'll do the SPQ. The SPQ was revised recently. Did you know that? That there were changes made in the seller property questionnaire? I bet not everyone knows that. Next week, I'm going to, how about that? I'll do the SPQ and the AVID, right? Because that would be, the AVID is the one that most affects agents because you don't know what to put down sometimes. You know, what are we really looking for? How should we describe it? You know, you can take pictures and do all that sort of stuff, you know, but we'll, we'll go through how to fill out those two, SPQ, TDS, next week. Be here, be there, or be square, right? I don't think people say that anymore. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.